Welcome to Naked Reflections, brought to you from the Wolf Institute. I'm Ed Kessler, and each week I'll be taking an in-depth look at the stories reported by our friends over at The Naked Scientists. What does the latest scientific stuff mean for the rest of us? Stay with us and find out. A home is something everyone deserves, however troubled they are. By the same token, homelessness is something no one should have to endure. But homelessness is rife in our towns and cities, or it was until the arrival of COVID-19. The speed with which rough sleepers were swept off the streets then seemed to expose the lack of political will there was to deal with this problem in normal times. Homelessness is our subject this week. According to Shelter, the housing and homeless charity, 280,000 people in the UK were homeless in 2019. At a very basic level, it's to do with a lack of housing stock. Here's Rupert Saw of Freedom Engineering speaking on the Naked Scientist podcast with some innovative suggestions about how to rapidly increase the number of homes. There's no one ubiquitous process that does everything, but essentially if you take your desk jet printer and literally scale it in your mind, and instead of ink you're putting through cement or gypsum, let's say, then you're somewhere close to where we're going with this. Uh, And, you know, it seems almost uh, strange to think that you could squirt cement out and and it wouldn't slump all over the ground, but that's because, you know, cement is used in moulds at the moment Mm. and concrete, and and it's designed to be sloppy. And you take out those uh, retardants and and things like that, and, and it's starts to set quite quickly. So very, very quickly you can build up three-dimensional structures, very, very big ones, if, if that indeed, is indeed what you're into doing. My guests this week discussing homelessness are Chris Jenkin of It Takes a City, a partnership bringing together the public and private sectors with the aim of ending rough sleeping, and Laura Leek, a trustee of Cambridge Street Pastors who is out and about every Friday and Saturday night offering help and advice to anyone in trouble or who simply need someone to talk to. Before we get on to societal and structural issues, do you agree that, as Rupert Saw implies, we've been woefully unimaginative about building up the housing stock in this country? Chris? Well, I think we've been woefully unprepared. The number of new houses required year by year has been woefully short of what of what is needed for a long time to come, as is well known. And Shelter, in particular, has pointed this out. Um, the number of new homes required is is significant. All governments say they're going to produce you know, many more homes than before. It often does not happen. There are certainly, I'm no expert, by the way, on this, but there are certainly structural issues about the use of land, uh, about the way that developments happen, etc. Uh, means that properties aren't built as quickly as possible. Um, in, in essence, the land situation is build properties at a time when they are the pr- at the price that the builder wants them to sell for. That, of course, is completely against the requirements for people who require social housing, um, who don't want to wait until the price is too high. So there's a structural issue. But there is innovation and happening actually in Cambridge. We have put in place some new houses uh, made using innovative techniques in terms of not just the way they're built, but the materials they're built with. And they're proving already in a small scale of great success. And that innovation, has that been applied in the response to COVID-19? Because it is remarkable how, how so many homeless have suddenly disappeared from our streets. It did not sell off its housing stock to to others, and therefore it does um, own quite a large proportion of the housing stock in Cambridge. And I pay great credit to my colleagues and friends in the in the city council for the efforts they're making to make homes available to those that are currently homeless in the hotels. Uh, for example, repurposing social housing um, uh, for those in hotels and borrowing new properties. And there's quite a bit of effort underway to accelerate that in order to provide opportunity for all those in the hotels to move on. But one um, technique that you will have seen made much of in the press is, is the use of modular techniques. And so we've put six homes on land belonging to the Church Christ the Redeemer on Newmarket Road. It's a joint venture between Alia, the social investment firm, and Jimmy's. And six rough sleepers have moved in there, actually all from Jimmy's, five who were being fairly short term residents for whom this is a very welcome move on to their own home. And one of whom was rather a long term resident at Jimmy's who was moved in as a kind of primus inter pares, you know, needs a home, but also a kind of warden being a slightly older person. They've been in there a few weeks and a little community is forming and with some very positive feedback. Because these are basically, you're offering someone a brand new eco home that's very high tech and very modern. And it's their own private space, which for most people that have become homeless 
you don't get that. And of course, you're talking about Jimmy's night shelter. Now, Laura, the street pastors are not directly concerned with homelessness, um, but you've obviously got an insight into some of the problems they face. What we do really is that we go out at night and take care of people in need. And that could be anybody. It could be from the drunken girl out of the club to the homeless person that needs a hand, whoever. But really, we got more involved with the homelessness situation now because Chris asked for help when he put together the service that we are doing now to distribute food to the homeless. They've been put in to hotels. And so the street passes, some of us have stepped in. We are helping with the distribution of food. Laura, who are the street pastors? Give us an idea of who, who joins your group. And it was started in Cambridge by Chris. It's all over the UK. We are all first aid trained. So whatever we encounter, we can help. You know, sometimes fights happen and we have we don't have to intervene, but we do help. I go out with a lady who is 80 years old or maybe even more, and she's so active and full of joy to just go out and, and help the situation. She says she can't sleep at night, so she'd rather do that. <laughs> I'd rather be in bed. Obviously, we are recruiting. We take volunteers. Um, the only thing we ask is, obviously, to be part of a church and to be willing to be up at night from 10 to 4 in the morning. I mean, you say it's, it's a church-inspired, a church-organised uh, street pastors, but of course there are interesting collaborations with homelessness involving other communities. I know the Jewish community in Cambridge works with various churches. Are the street pastors only Christian or are there other people as well? If other faith communities wanted to take part, would that be OK? The way that it's set up, it's a Christian charity. It's, it's a very good question because someone has asked that question. They wanted to, to become uh, street pastors, it's under the umbrella of a charity, a Christian charity. So that is the fundamental to be part of it, the requirement. I, think, I know, Chris, that with the Homeless Project, there is interesting, not just ecumenical, but a cross-religious collaboration. And how would it take a city, Chris, uh, address this? Our aim is to try and look at all the different aspects of preventative and uh, curative measures um, by bringing different organisations together. So we don't aspire to lead and do stuff ourselves. We established action groups um, about 18 months ago around housing, support, employment, uh, a women's group, a young people's group around information, data. And we found that there was a great desire, as Laura was saying, for all these different organisations, public and private and third sector, to meet together, in particular business community, who felt excluded, I think, and were clearly troubled by the problem literally on their doorstep. So we began to work with them to see ways in which they could become part of the solution, not just troubled by the, by the problem. So the great welter of financial and uh, support of different sorts that arose for these different projects. And so we have started a mentoring project which is designed to, in a sense, do what the street passes do, but on a more specific one-to-one -one basis. It's great. I mean, Laura, you I remember this. When you see the same person every month, you build a little rapport with them, don't you? And I remember it was, it was Tommy that you've probably met. Actually, it was Tommy that started this. When I first met him in March 2009, that I learned half of all I learned about homelessness from one conversation with Tommy on the street. And we met again and again. Um, the mentoring scheme is intended to be a kind of um, a monitored and supervised scheme where you can get with someone on a regular basis and just help them live life in a community alongside any professional support. That's one thing that's starting. And in particular, we're looking for volunteers from the street pastors and from the Church's Homeless Project and elsewhere to become part of this scheme. And um, we've also started an employment project, which is run by now CHS Group in partnership with Winter Comfort, uh, specifically reaching out to those in the hostels and in the hotels and people in their accommodation and reaching out to employers and trying to broker the one to the other in order that people get um, a tolerant employer. Um, on housing, we have just formed a new community land trust that was incorporated by the Financial Conduct Authority just last week, very exciting. And um, we're just about to submit a pre-application planning for 20 homes. Um, 20 modular homes on meanwhile land just north of Cambridge and we're just about to start to engage at the political level to be sure that we can run through the planning processes quickly. So it sounds like a lot of uh, innovative activities that can be applied locally and of course regionally and nationally. I, I wonder Laura with the the fact that so many homeless now are, are in hotels whether that provides an opportunity for you to deliver that mentoring and, and actually help when we are back in a more normal environment. Yeah we meet 
the people on the street where they are. And uh, in my experience, there are some people that claim to be homeless and you see them on the street begging, but they do have a house to go back to. And there are people that have been tried to be given houses, but they cannot be confined in those four walls and they keep on turning back on the street, uh, either because they can't respect the rules that their house is given them or simply because they got such ingrained psychological issues that they really cannot be underneath a roof. And, you know, th- these are classic examples are males coming out of the army. They've been to war. They, they struggle. Drug addict people, they, they prefer finding their home community on the street with uh, their other companions when they share drugs. So, yes, we see these other aspects. So, so, Laura, will the homeless always be with us then? I think what we are doing is good. What Cambridge is doing is already really, really good because we have a number of charities and associations that they work together. They talk to each other. And I've seen these as a street pastor. I've seen the police talking to, you know, Texas City, Jimmy, all name them. They all get together and talk and they come up with solutions. This is why in Cambridge you see not so many people on the street, but you see many people coming to Cambridge from other places. And I have met in during my patrols people that come from, I don't know, Peterborough or somewhere, some, some other places in the country. They come to beg in Cambridge because Cambridge is rich. Cambridge gives them the opportunity. Cambridge will put them in a house they have this um, situation that they can be put in a place they can be given a house and they can be given a help to find a job you know lots of facilities that perhaps are not available in the rest of the country i think the poor will always be with us but they don't have to be homeless but if they choose to be homeless uh, we can't obviously as laura says force them into a place there are circumstances though where maybe that choice is not a rational choice and there are issues around the care act and so forth for some that are habitually homeless and make some obviously very poor choices whether in fact the way we use legislation is appropriate and whether they can in fact be offered something better but our aim is to stop rough sleeping due to homelessness in other words that there is a home to go to and the point about a lot of the street work, it's there because there isn't a home to go to. And therefore, you've got to offer a better sleeping bag because there's no other choice. What well, we want to make sure that there is a choice for people to go to. And therefore, people don't have to be on the street. And I think that that's what we're trying to achieve. And certainly the political settlement now that's arising from COVID is completely transformed the environment. I remember in the early days of the Cambridge Churches Homeless Project, struggling to get agreement to spend one night of B&B budget that I thought was held by the local authority or one of the other agencies. And it turned out, well, yes, there is in principle a budget, but we haven't actually set it up yet. So that one person had to sleep out. We've now got 100 people in hotels for months at a time. You know, that anecdote for me illustrates the profound change in the political will and the political settlement arising from COVID. So for all of us involved in the industry, if you like, of trying to help people, suddenly it's possible that our aims, even if held somewhat lightly, could actually become fulfilled. Let's take a pause there. You're listening to Naked Reflections with me, Ed Kessler. My guests are Laura Leake and Chris Jenkin. And we're talking about homelessness. Here's another practical idea from the Naked Scientist podcast about how to build houses quickly. We're very interested in bamboo because it is very fast growing. Uh, It's widely distributed around the world, particularly in areas where populations are growing and populations are moving to cities, but also where trees don't grow. Um, And it's extremely strong. There's a long history of using bamboo in its natural form uh, for houses um, in vernacular culture, so people, basically people building without architects. Um, And it's only in the last 20 or 30 years that people have processed bamboo into the type of materials we use in conventional construction. That was Michael Ramage of the University of Cambridge. Well, we've heard a number of intriguing ideas from scientists, and I'm just wondering how much the government, whether it's local or national, liaises with those who have experience of homelessness. I I think we've probably been slightly guilty of nominalism. 
you know, nominally having someone. We're meeting at Jimmy's. Jimmy's, have you got someone that you can bring in? Look, so we can actually talk to someone. And we did take someone, in fact, one of the Emmaus companions who'd been homeless for quite a time to see a, a modular housing project in Oxford. And it was really helpful to chat with him on the way back and to show him these homes and how would it feel for you? And that was a big part of our learning as to whether this particular style of construction would be suitable and, and acceptable, which it was very much so. So there's a, there's a lot of engagement but I wouldn't say that all of our groups have a permanent member of people that experience homelessness, but our trustee body does have two people who've had lengthy experience of homelessness, um, and one of whom is, is sort of slightly on the edge at the minute. And I have to say that I've seen uh, people that were placed in hotels, now they're still out. And these are homeless people that I know from my days on the street, and now they're out again, because they are that sort of people that cannot be help in that sense with the houses. And what might that be, Laura? That's a good question. <laughs> Some of them, it's ingrained. I met a man that is here in Cambridge and he cannot be in a home. He said to me, he's, he's happy where he is. Apparently, he's not a drug user. He doesn't look like one of those people that abuse alcohol either. And he's just happy to be out on the street. Simple as that. You know, you can't, you can't force a person to live within the society um, regulation. They are rebelling against the society, some of them. Some of them are out because it unluck, because of many other reasons. Some are out because of choice. Maybe a small percentage of them, but it's their choice. Are there lessons from overseas that we can apply here? I noticed before we started this podcast that Holland has a constitutional right for everyone to have access to a home, which I thought was very interesting. But are there examples from overseas that we can learn from in the UK? Chris? Yes, there are. I mean, the big model that we look at here is Helsinki in Finland. They had a major housing first programme, which got pretty well everybody off the street. They built um, blocks of flats for people to live in. These were supported communities. It wasn't a ghetto. You know, it was a mixed economy community of people and they've been very successful. It's a lovely little PowerPoint slide set that I'd love to just cross out Helsinki and put Cambridge. And it would read the dream that we have been trying to go for. I think the language we're using um, is so important, isn't it? You talk about the, the rough sleepers, the difference between a house and a home. And I wonder whether the term homeless itself is, is unhelpful. I think there was an American study that talked about unhoused rather than homeless. Laura, I wonder if you could comment on the language that's used and in terms of how we talk about the homeless. We have to be careful to say home less without a house because you find, like I said earlier, you can find many people on the street, sleeping on the street, that they, they feel home because they are in their group, in their environment, in their circle of friends that they, they can call home and that's how they feel. And so it, technically it's incorrect to call them homeless because they say home is where the heart is. Um, is where you feel safe. It's not a house. It's a different thing. We have to be careful how we how we use it and saying rough sleeper. Perhaps it's better to say rough sleepers because many of them choose to do that to re to sleep roughly on the street rather than in the comfort of uh, four walls. I disagree slightly with with what has been said. In the obviously you have to make a home where there's a home to be made. And if that's only can be made on the street because there is no house to go to, of course, that does become home. But that's the problem, because then you become entrenched because it's the only home, you know. And so people find a home. If you like the housing market, it might end up with a palace at one end. At the other end, it's a shop doorway. And there's a, just a seamless market from a shop doorway to a churchyard, to a tent, to a shed, to a car, to someone's sofa, to temporary accommodation, to a squat, your own flat, to a house, you know, etc. It's a continuum. And so like all markets, markets resolve themselves out. So those that don't have access to these bits up here will find something down here that for them becomes home because that has to be. But the reason they do that is because there isn't a home up here to go to. So we tend to say that people, we don't call people roofless. We call them homeless because they haven't got what I would call a home to go to, not in terms of a house, but a place they can flourish. And of course, you can't flourish on the street. You can survive, and with the help of the street pastors at night and with the CCH group and CCHP across the winter and Jimmy's and Winter Comfort, you can survive on the street. 
but woe betide a society that is happy that people just survive on the street because we know the life expectancy is extremely low. And therefore, we've had to do all that because there hasn't been a home to go to. But one, but if there are homes to go to, we don't need to do that. Some may, as Laura says, choose that. Now, that choice might be because they become entrenched. It's the only thing they know. But that doesn't mean to say it's good. Well, that's all we've got time for this week. Thanks to my guests, Laura Leake and Chris Jenkin. And thanks to you two for listening. If you'd like to get in touch with any comments, thoughts or reflections of your own, you can email nakedreflections at wolf.cam.ac.uk. Let us know what subjects you'd like to hear more about and how you'd like us to cover them. We'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, you can find more episodes of Naked Reflections and subscribe to the Naked Reflections podcast wherever you access your podcasts or at nakedscientists.com reflections. Do join us next time.